All right, welcome back to Cloud Church. I'm Robert Breaker, missionary evangelist to the Spanish and English speaking people. Uh, we've been going verse by verse through the epistles of Paul in order of when they were written, and we are now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm looking forward to this chapter. It's interesting. It's chapter 13 and only 13 verses. But, but, we finished up last time in, in, in chapter 12 with verse 31. And as I went through that ver uh, chapter and explained to you about the, the gifts of the Spirit, we ended by saying, and well, actually Paul saying, Yet I show unto you a more excellent way. And I applied that to that chapter, and I, I believe, if I remember correctly, I applied the more excellent way to salvation. Of course, the gospel is the more excellent way. Um, the gospel is, is the more excellent way because the more excellent way is salvation and preaching. So if I remember correctly, I told you that the more excellent way was prophesying and how we looked at the different gifts of the Spirit. And above all, the gifts that you should want would be the gift of prophecy, which today, the gift of prophecy is simply preaching the Bible. When you preach the Bible and you're preaching, you are prophesying because you're saying God said thus and so, and what God said is prophecy. But... I started thinking about this as I was reading through here again and studying for, for this message or this teaching of chapter 13. And in the old days, there were no chapter divisions, no verse divisions in the Bible. And I wonder if chapter 31 doesn't tie in, excuse me, verse 31 of chapter 12 doesn't directly speak to chapter 13 in verse 1. And if the more excellent way isn't what the entire chapter of verse 13 is about. So I wonder if when he says, Behold, I show you a more excellent way, if that isn't 13 verse 1 and all the way to verse 13, what is the, that whole chapter about? Well, I'll go ahead and spill the beans. <laughs> it's about charity. So probably Paul is saying that the more excellent way, more excellent than anything, is charity. Now why do I say that? Because both Paul and Peter say in their writings that there is one thing that's more important than anything ever. And what is that one thing? This right here. Let me show you that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. I'm going to show you um, what they're saying. Of course, we're talking about charity. I'm going to show you what Paul says. I'm going to show you what Peter says. And this, to me, is incredible because... This is so important. This is the most important thing that we can have as Christians. And I've yet to meet Christians nowadays that have this. So few people today that claim to be Christians have or practice charity. That's what's so sad. So very sad. So go to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14. Colossians 3.14 and in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 14, look at what Paul says. This is so incredible. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. So Paul says, above all things. Well, that's pretty interesting. If you're putting something above all things, you're esteeming it very high. He said to put on charity. And then he tells us charity is the bond of perfectness. If you want to be a good Christian, if you want to be as perfect a Christian as you can be, you need charity. And Paul says it's, it's above all things it's that important to have charity. Interesting. What does the Peter say? Let me look it up here. I've got it here on my computer. Uh, Peter tells us about charity in 1 Peter 4, 8. Now watch what Peter says. And above all things, have fervent charity. So it almost copies Paul. So in 1 Peter 4, 8, Peter tells us, look, the same as Paul, the most important thing above all things, he said not just charity, he said fervent charity. Wow, Oop, I spelled charity wrong. I always do that. My mind is going 100 miles a minute. So, Paul says, above all things, have charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And Peter tells us, hey, above all things, have fervent charity. Now, I didn't read the rest of the verse. It says, 
And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. An interesting verse 9, he says, Use hospitality one to another without grudging. So according to the Bible, according to both Peter and Paul, there is one thing that's more important than anything ever. It's above all things. And that one thing that you should have is charity. And yet so few Christians today have charity. I used to belong to a church. I won't give you the name of the church. don't want to you know, uh, say anything bad about them. God bless them. I pray for them. But we used to belong to a church, and a lot of people used to say, well, that, that, that church doesn't have any charity. It's kind of funny because there was a church split there years ago, and the pastor that, or the assistant pastor left and started himself a new church. <laughs> and when he did, he named his church Charity Baptist Church. <laughs> I just always thought that so funny. What, what was he saying? Was he saying, yeah, that church that we just were in didn't have any. So we're going to show that we're different. We have it, and they don't. <laughs> That's what I always thought. But that is interesting. So now you can go up to other Christians and say, hey, i got a question for you. What did both Peter and Paul say was the most important thing above anything, above all things? And see how many answer that, that, that answer that correctly. Charity. Charity is so, so important. It is so important because it's above all things, and it is the more excellent way. And yet, so few Christians have it today. Now, look at the world. The world is not Christian. The world today is pagan and is evil. But instead of charity, the world today wants to, to take another word. And the world today tries to preach tolerance. And if you look at the world today... They all talk about, oh, you've got to be politically correct. You've got to be politically correct, which is nothing more than communism. That's where communism, uh, political correct correctness started from, communism. But they say, oh, be tolerant. Be tolerant of others. Be tolerant of other people's religion. Be tolerant of other people's sexual preference. Be tolerant. And yet they're the most intolerant people in the world. It's true. Uh, I've met people that aren't saved, and all they say is, well, you need to tolerate me if you don't like me. And yet they don't tolerate anything you do. So see how important charity is? What is charity? What does the word charity mean? Well, it's actually defined here in the Bible. As we read through chapter 13, it tells us what charity is. Charity basically is more than just giving. Nowadays when people talk about charity, the first thing they think is money, which is interesting. Charity is more than just money. When you say the word charity, a lot of people think, oh, you want me to give money to a charity. Well, there are things called charities, and they collect money, and they do good things for others. But charity isn't just money. Charity really is sacrificial giving. Charity is giving sacrificially, giving till it hurts. It's doing something for someone else when you don't have to, even when you don't want to. It's just because you know it's the right thing to do. Now, the thing that irks me about new versions of the Bible, almost every new version besides the King James Bible takes the word charity out, and they replace it with, I uh, almost wrote it in Spanish, <laughs> with love. I almost wrote amor. Um, love. But love and charity are different. So all you new versions of the Bible, they talk about, well, love is this, and love is that, and love... No, 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 it's charity. It's the idea of sacrificially giving. Why is that so important? Because it reminds us of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ loved us. That's why He died on the cross. But He sacrificially gave of Himself until all the blood spilled out every drop. So charity not only is a stronger word and a better word, it's a word that reminds us of Christ. It's a word that reminds us of doing for others. And it is the thing that the Bible says is above all things. A lot of people today, they don't understand the word love. People today look at the word love and they automatically think love is an emotion. Uh-uh. Love is an action. Jesus Christ's action on the cross was dying for our sins. So, the better word, the correct word, the King James Bible word, is charity. And new versions change that word to love, and they water it all down. So go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and begin in verse 1, and there's a lot of interesting things here. 
in this passage. The Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So he talks about how he speaks and, and the languages he speaks. Which is interesting because the very next chapter, chapter 14, is about tongues. Boy, I can't wait to get to that chapter. That's interesting. But he says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So the Apostle Paul says, I'm nothing but a little annoying little, bam, 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 you know, tambourine. Oh, I hate a tambourine. Oh, I hate those things. And they're just annoying. And they're not loud. And Paul says, if I don't have charity, I sound like one of those little annoying things with that small little tone. He says, I don't want to sound like that. I want to sound like somebody who knows what he's talking about. Though I speak with the tongues of men, well, what languages did Paul speak? Well, we know that Paul spoke Hebrew. We know that Paul spoke Latin. And we know that Paul spoke Greek. So Paul spoke several different languages. But he says, though I speak with the tongues of, uh, with the tongues of men and of angels. What's the language that angels speak? What is the language of the angels? I believe it's Hebrew. You see, Adam was created by God. And I believe when God created Adam, this was the language of heaven. And the language that was eventually passed on to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And that Hebrew is the actual language that the angels speak. And that's amazing because when you look at that language of Hebrew, you find an amazing, amazing language. Hebrew, every word in Hebrew comes from a root word with three letters. It's always three one, two, three letters. Why is that important? Well, it's the language, uh, I believe, of God. And the three letters represent the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Every word in Hebrew has its root in, in a, a root word with three complete letters. And every letter in Hebrew means something. Every word in Hebrew means several things. And every letter in Hebrew means a number. So when you write something in Hebrew, like a sentence... The sentence means something, but each of the words means something by itself. It has numerical value, but also every letter means something. Um, the other day I, I heard someone talking about the word Jesus in Hebrew. I don't know how to say it. Is it Yeshua or something to that? But the word Jesus or Yeshua in Hebrew, if you take all the letters of the words, and I'm not going to spell it out here, they said that each one of those letters in itself is a word and that the actual name of Jesus in Hebrew is a sentence. And it's something uh, to the effect, and I don't remember exactly, that the name Yeshua in Hebrew actually means the one who came from heaven to destroy the eye. <laughs> Amazing. Because the Illuminati today, under Satan, believe in the all-seeing eye. And so they have their little symbol on the back of the dollar. And actual Jesus Christ, his name, Jesus whether you knew that or not, is actually two words. J is the Hebrew word for Jehovah, shortened. And Seuss is the Greek word for saves. So the actual name of Jesus Christ means Jehovah saves. But the name of Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua, some people say is how you pronounce it. The actual name Yeshua means he who came from heaven to destroy the eye. Who is the eye? The Illuminati, the devil, the Antichrist, the all-seeing eye. So even the name of Jesus in Hebrew means something. No wonder the name of Jesus the devil hates. So what is this tongue of, of angels? Let's look at some verses. Let's go to Acts chapter 26 and verse 14. I'll just look at a couple verses and, and I'll try to prove that the actual language of Hebrew is indeed the language spoken in heaven. Some people believe that, some people don't. That's fine. In Acts 26, 14, it says, And when they were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So here the Apostle Paul is telling about what happened to him way back in Acts chapter 9 when he got saved. And when he got saved, he went blind. He was stricken blind, and he heard a voice speaking to him from heaven in, a, in the Hebrew tongue. Well, who was speaking to him? Well, either it was an angel or it was God. So what was the language that the angel or God spoke? It was Hebrew. So that's a pretty good, strong point that the, the tongue spoken in heaven, spoken by angels, is the Hebrew tongue. 
So verse 1, Though I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. Okay, now let's look. I forgot to start my clock here, so I don't want to go over in this teaching. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, verse 2. Now we just finished up at thecloudchurch.org with seven mysteries in the Bible in our weekly sermon series. And that was a great blessing. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. But God revealed unto Paul many different mysteries. He says, though I understand all mysteries and have all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Paul says, I am nothing without charity. You see how important it is? See why they say it's above all things? You're nothing without charity, without sacrificial giving, without putting others above yourself. It says, verse 3, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me, profiteth me nothing. You can give away all you have and, it, and not have charity. <laughs> Even though you give to charities, you know, so how much did you give this year to charity? Well, you can give to charity, but you can do it without charity. A lot of people give to charities for a tax write-off. They don't have any charity within themselves. So charity is something that you practice. It's because you want to, because you, you feel like it's the right thing to do, and you, you say, i got to do this. It's right. So verse... Oh, let me read verse 3, 3 again. But though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. It's all about your motive of why. Why are you doing it? Verse 4, Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So charity is a lot of things. Verses 4 through 8 divine, define charity. It says that it's patient and it suffers long. It says it's kind or polite. It envieth not. There's no jealousy in charity. It vaunteth not itself. What does that mean? It means humility. There is humility in charity. It says it's not her own. In other words, it's, it's concerned more about others than yourself. It's not easily provoked, verse 5. So that has temperance. And then it says, thinketh no evil. So when you have charity, you're always thinking with the right mind. That's why Paul says it's the bond of perfectness. When you're living right, doing right, you're kind, you're loving, you're caring, and you're putting others above yourself, you're a true Christian. It's the bond of perfectness. Charity. So let's read that. Verse, verse 4. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own. Is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Verse 8, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish. And now we get into a part of the scriptures where a lot of people have their own ideas of certain things of what this is talking about. It's interesting, just last week someone called me and told me, Hey, I was thinking about this passage and I think it means this and this, but I'm not sure it might mean this. And I was taught in Bible school that, it, that it's talking about one thing in particular. So I'll mention what, what some people believe, what I was taught in Bible school, but then what I believe that he's talking about. Because to me, when you mention charity, you're pointing to this one right here, Jesus. Because the example of charity is Jesus. Look at that. Uh, a verse, verse 4, charity suffered long. Well, Jesus sure suffered long on the cross and dying for all of our sins. Charity is kind. Christ was kind. Mostly, when there were evil people, well, he was righteously indignant against the Pharisees when he beat them. But he was mostly kind to people. He didn't envy. He didn't vaunt himself. He wasn't puffed up. Uh, he, besaved, he did not behave himself unseemly, verse 5. He didn't seek after his own. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He wasn't easily provoked. He thought no evil. Jesus never had an evil thought. Uh, rejoiceth not in iniquity, rejoiced in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hoping all things, adoring all things. Charity never faileth. But then he says, whether there be prophecies, whether there be tongues, or whether there be knowledge. So three things that the apostle says, Paul says, that will someday cease. Prophecy will cease. Well, when will prophecy cease? When it's all fulfilled. When Jesus comes back. Uh, tongues shall cease. 
And then he says, knowledge shall cease. So these are things that shall all cease someday. Now the question that we're going to get to here is this, when do these things cease? That, my friend, is a good question. That's what many different Christians have many different ideas on what this next verse or verses are talking about. So let's look at verse 9. Well, verse 8 again. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Something's going to vanish. It's going to cease. Why will it vanish? What makes it cease? And it says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Alright, so 9 and 10, well, 8, 9, and 10 are the, the verses that there's a lot of, of indecision about among Christians. Many Christians have an idea, well, I think that that which is perfect is this, and I think that which is perfect is that. What I was taught in Bible school, and what a lot of Christians think, is that which is perfect is come, they say that is the Bible. Now, Paul is writing here in about 60 A.D., maybe 59 A.D. And if you know the Bible, man, I'm running out of room up here. Here's Jesus Christ on the cross. The book of Acts is going on. And the last book Paul wrote was 60-something. I want to say about 66 A.D. I'd have to check that. But what was the very last book written in the Old Testament? It was written about 90 A.D., and that was the book of Revelation. So a lot of Christians say that this passage is talking about the Bible. And that Paul says, when that which is perfect is come, the entire Bible, New Testament is finished with the book of Revelation, then that which is in part shall be done away. And so I've seen gospel tracts, I've heard preachers preach on this, I've heard others teach that this passage is talking about when the Bible is completed, and it was completed in 90 AD, then that which is perfect is come. But where is that in this passage? Nowhere in this passage does it mention the Bible. And nowhere is it saying that that which is perfect has come is the Scriptures. So some people say it's the Bible. Now what do I think? Well, this is my opinion. There's no way to, to say it. But charity ties in so much with Jesus that I personally think when that which is perfect has come is Jesus. Because He's perfect. And when is Jesus Christ coming back? Well, here's the church age, and way out here is the rapture. After the rapture is the tribulation. And then that which is perfect is come will be Jesus when he comes at Armageddon. And in the millennium, we won't know in part. Anything you ever want to know in the millennium, Jesus is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. You just go ask him. So, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, because we don't know everything. But when that which is perfect is come, verse 10 then that which is in part shall be done away. So Jesus will literally be on the earth in the millennium. Am I, is that showing up over there? Yeah. In the millennium, and whatever we don't know, he's going to fill us in. He's going to tell us. So maybe that which is perfect has come. It can also apply to death. When we as Christians die in the church age, then we go to Christ. And then that which is perfect has come in the sense that we have we are in heaven with him so I don't know that's one of those passages that it's like hmm it could go either way uh, I think it's stretching it to try to apply it to the Bible but I think it makes a lot more sense to try to apply it to Jesus Christ now <clears throat> another guy told me well that applies to when Paul's ministry ended and that's when well I don't uh, you can make it say whatever you want it's one of those things where to me, it just appears to be speaking about Jesus. He's the perfect. That which is perfect has come. That's Jesus Christ. When he comes, then that which is in part shall be done away. So, read it if you find anything else, or if you can find anywhere on the Bible where it tells us what exactly what that which is perfect is, let me know. <clears throat> so, verse 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, and I understood as a child, and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I love that verse. That's a very... Uh, much quoted verse among men. Uh, men look at other men and they say, quit being childish. It's a, it's a shame to me to see how childish people are today. Um, when I was a kid, I, I saw what a real man was. My grandfathers and, and my father, and, and to see real men. And real men, a lot of them have charity. 
They know how to do things. They're, they're sacrificial giving. They work hard for their family. They work to, to help others. They do everything they can. A lot of so-called men today aren't really men. They care only about themselves. They're childish. They don't have charity. Go back to chapter 4. Charity suffereth long. Well, most people today don't have any suffering. They don't have any charity. They can't put up with others. They're not kind. They only think about themselves. They only think in evil. They don't like the truth, verse 6. They can't bear things. So it defines what is a man. A man is someone who has finally understood what charity is. And it's more about doing for others than yourself. So verse 11, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Well, that's something important that we should do is put away childish things. We should grow up and live for Christ. Verse 12, and, and by the way, let me say this, since he's talking about a child, children don't have charity. It's very rare to find little two, three, four-year-old kids with charity. What do they do? They say, I want this, I want that. And they start crying, and, and a lot of times they'll throw temper tantrums and things like that. So charity is something you learn as you grow. And it's almost like the Apostle Paul saying, the more you learn charity, the more you have grown. And the more you become a man. So stop being a baby. Why is that important? Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. <laughs> Verse 1. 1 Corinthians 3, 1. Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. He says, you're all a bunch of stinking babies because you don't have this right here. And in that chapter, he tells them, he says, look, you guys, all you do is sit around and fight. Chapter 3 again of 1 Corinthians, he says, he says, for you are carnal, yet carnal, he says in verse 3, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So even though they haven't grown up as men, they're still childish men. They're carnal men. They're not spiritual men. So he calls them a bunch of babies, and he says, all you do is, is run around and, well, I'm this one, no, I'm this one, and fight and fight and fight. Well, if you have charity, you wouldn't fight. Charity is, all right, you are more important than me. I esteem you above myself. Tell me what you want to say. And, and suffer that person to, to be in their folly for a time. Now, there's a time when you have to rebuke people. But you can do it kindly. There's a Bible verse that talks about speak the truth in love. So, charity, just so important, just so important. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Verse 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now, this is another reason why I think that verse 10, that which is perfect, is Jesus. Because now we see through a glass darkly, we can't see Jesus, he's not here. But then face to face. Someday we'll all be face to face with Jesus Christ. So that's why I think that the passage is talking about that which is perfect is come is when Jesus Christ comes back. And then we'll know all things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I even know even as I am known. So we know in part, and what we know is what the Bible teaches. But there will be a time when we will know as we are known. What does that mean? That means you'll know Christ personally face to face and he knows you and you know him. And you'll know how he knows you. <laughs> that makes sense. Even as also I am known. There's a couple verses that talk about face to face and glass darkly. Let's just look at those up. Numbers 24:17 is one of those. Numbers 24:17 where it talks about Seeing through a glass darkly. Let's quickly get the context of that in the Bible. What does that mean, seeing through a glass darkly? And I forgot the passage. What was it? Numbers 24, 17. And it says, And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering. Oh, I'm in 23, 17. I'll get it in a minute. 24, 17. Excuse me. And it says there, I shall see him. Now watch this. This is without a doubt talking about Jesus Christ. And so the question is, when he refers to seeing through a, a glass darkly, is he talking about perhaps an Old Testament reference and talking about Jesus? Numbers 
kind of sounds like this verse about seeing face to face, know in part, then know as I am known. Numbers 24, 17 says, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not now. Sounds like Paul. Someday we will see him, but now we see him through a glass darkly. And then it says, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and shall smite the corners of Moab and shall destroy the children of Sheth or Seth. So, was this the verse that perhaps he was remembering when he wrote this down? We don't see him now, but we will see him sometime. There's another one, Psalm 17 15. A lot of the things that Paul, because Paul knew the Old Testament so well, that he writes in his writings are quotes from Old Testament verses. Psalm 17 15. In Psalm 17, 15, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. So here is a verse that talks about beholding the face of God and awaking in righteousness. And he says there in verse 10, or no, verse 12, excuse me, face to face. Then there will be a time when we'll see God face to face. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Here's a New Testament reference. And uh, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that's why I say, when that which is perfect is come, to me sounds like Jesus. Because he says, verse 12, For now we see through a glass darkly. What do we see? We see Jesus. And we see him, we don't see him perfectly as he is. The Bible is our glass. The Bible is like a mirror. You read the Bible and you look in it and it shows you who you are. And you can see Jesus in the Bible, but you don't see him clearly. Because you're not seeing his face. All you're seeing is, is about him. But it says, but then, face to face. When you die or when Jesus appears, you will one day see him face to face clearly with your own eyes. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. So, back to 2 Corinthians 3. It's interesting how he talks about a glass and face to face. Verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as the Spirit of the Lord. So what it sounds like, with these references that we looked up, is that Paul is talking about at the rapture, is when we will clearly see face to face our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's when we will have a glorified body. And we will have the same body that Jesus had when he resurrected from the dead. So, is that what he's talking about? Does that, like I said, a lot of people have spent a lot of time debating what verse 9 and 10 mean in verse Corinthians 13. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And many say, well, that's talking about the completion of the New Testament. That's the Bible. But as I read verse 12, and I read 2 Corinthians and I look at some Old Testament, it looks like it's when Jesus comes. And so when I read verse 12, I read it like this, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. We who are saved and are living in this world see through a glass darkly. But then, at the rapture, we shall see Jesus face to face. Now I know in part, but then at the rapture shall I know even as also I am known. That's what it appears to be to me. Now, I could be wrong, and if so, praise God. I like being wrong because that means I'm no smarter than God. He's smarter than me. Amen? Um, but I like to, to know the truth. So if you've got anything else on that, please email me. I'd love to hear it. But it appears that seeing face-to-face -face is when we see Jesus in the face at the rapture. Now, verse 13 and chapter 13. So here we are in 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And it says, Now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is what? Is charity. So you have three things mentioned here. Three things. Faith, hope, and charity. 
Well, faith is what saves us, so we're only saved by, by faith. Hope, what is the hope? Well, the Bible says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our hope is the rapture. So, what is charity? I guess that's our way of living. When we're saved, um, it's, our, it's our soul that's saved by faith. But the Bible says that someday the day of redemption is when Jesus comes at the rapture. That's when you'll get a glorified body. So your soul ties in with the faith. The body ties in with the hope, the blessed hope of the rapture, your glorified body. So does charity have to do with the spirit? If you think about it, when someone's a kind Christian, they say he's got a good Christian spirit. Which means he probably has a lot of charity. So body, soul, and spirit, does that, does that kind of tie in there with this verse? So 1 Corinthians 13, 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. So notice how verse 13 says, And now. But then look at verse 12. For now we see through a glass darkly. Now is here in the flesh. But then, face to face, now in part, but then. So see the contrast of now, when we're alive today, and then something changes at the rapture. Now, but then, now, but then. So the context to me is have charity and wait for the rapture. Because at the rapture, God will reveal some things to us. In verse 10, that which is perfect is come, I believe, is Jesus. And when he is come, when he comes, all this in part shall be done away with. Then we shall know even as we are known. And now abideth faith, charity, hope, and charity. Those are what we as Christians should have and practice, faith, hope, and charity. But the greatest of these is charity. So do you have charity? I want to close this uh, teaching with Galatians. Because the Bible talks about the works of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. And it's interesting that so many people today that claim to be Christians don't have any charity whatsoever. There are many people today that claim to be Christians, and all they do is fight with one another. Just as, as 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about. Paul says, I can't talk to you as a spiritual, but as a carnal, as unto babes. And all they do is fight and fight and fight. Why is it that so many Christians today, all they do is fight? It's sad. I had a friend one time that said he got onto one of these Christian talk forum things on the internet, and, you know, they would... There were people that asked questions and even people respond. And he said, I got on that for a couple of months and all the time I was reading and responding. And he goes, I had to quit it. He said, they said they were Christians. If they were yelling, they were screaming, they were writing bad words, they were cussing, they were angry. If you didn't agree with them, they were mad at you and would cuss at you. He said, they didn't have charity. So it's amazing to me how many people in the world today claim to be Christians and the thing that both Paul and Peter said was the most important thing above all things, they don't even have. What do they have? Well, here's what a lot of Christians have. They have the works of the flesh. They're carnal. Paul says, I cannot write unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, as unto babes. Well, if you're carnal, then you're walking in the lust of the flesh. And Galatians 5.16 says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you're walking in the Spirit, then you can have charity. It's much easier to have charity when you're walking in the Spirit. Verse 17, For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So if you're walking in the flesh, you can't do what you want, because you don't have charity. But charity is what God wants, and it's the bond of perfectness, and it helps us to do right. So put aside the flesh, walk in the Spirit, do the things of God, and then you'll have charity. The most important thing, according to Peter and Paul. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. So well, that's a long list of the works of the flesh. Now what is in contrast the fruits of the Spirit? Well, verse 22 tells us what the fruits of the Spirit are. And this is so important because I've known Christians, and I've loved them, and I've appreciated them. But when I looked at their life, I couldn't find one, not one, 
of the nine fruits of the Spirit. They were attacking, they were mean, they were hateful, uh, they had no charity, all they did was call names and attack people and put people down. Where is the kindness? Where is the long-sufferingness? That, that's not a Christian attitude, that's not charity. What are the nine fruits of the Spirit? Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. There you go. Charity is long-suffering. Suffereth long, the Bible says. Gentleness, well that's kind, goodness and faith, meekness and temperance against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Interesting because Paul said, charity envieth not, vaunteth not itself. Let's go back and read that one more time after having read this. And then we'll close. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Excuse me, chapter 13. And look at how many of those same words in the fruits of the Spirit were mentioned with charity. Verse 15, charity suffereth long, long suffering, and is kind. Well, that's over there, and is is gentleness. That's gentleness, kind. If you're a kind person, they say you're a gentleman. <laughs> It says, uh, Charity bondeth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Well, verse 26 of Galatians 5 said, Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another. Hmm. Uh, and it says, Rejoice not in iniquity, uh, rejoiceth in truth, beareth all things. Charity bears all things. What is uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit is meekness. And goodness, faith, temperance. Uh, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether it be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether it be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it be knowledge, it shall, it shall vanish away. So, there's something to think about. I guess I'll close there. I don't know how long I've gone, but it's amazing to me to see how important charity is. And I wish that many Christians today would practice charity. There's a lot of Christians today that are militant Christians, and there's nothing wrong with that if you're militant the correct way. The Bible says to earnestly contend for the faith. Paul said, I've fought the good fight of faith. I've kept the faith. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're a wimp, but it also means you don't attack your own. If you're in a battle and you're fighting a battle in the military, you don't shoot someone in the back that's on your side. And so charity in the Bible is learning how to deal with other Christians. Be charitable. If you have this, then people will listen to you because they see you're real and you're genuine. You want to win somebody to Jesus Christ and you don't have charity, they won't listen to a word you say. I remember one time I was working at a Piggly Wiggly, which is a um, grocery store. And I remember working at this Piggly Wiggly and this guy came in and he said, I'm a Christian and I sell peanut brittle to try to help poor orphans or something like that. And he said, you want to buy my peanut brittle? I said, well... That's nice what you do, but I, I don't like painted brindle and I don't want to eat it. Uh, it hurts my teeth and it's not something that I like, so I'm sorry. And you know what he did? He said, well, you're a horrible person, and walked away. away. When he said that, I wouldn't buy his peanut brittle for all the money in the world. When a guy treats you like that, you want nothing to do with somebody like that. The man had no charity, and yet he was coming and asking for money for charity. <laughs> That's interesting. See, it's your attitude, it's your, it's your motive on why you do what you do. Now if you're a Christian and you have no charity and you're mean to other Christians and you attack them and you put them down, uh, how does that Bible verse say a brother offended is more hard to be one than I don't remember the rest of the verse but that's what charity is. It's loving other Christians sacrificially putting up and giving and, and you, it doesn't mean you have to love them, <laughs> you just have to put up with them and you don't have to put them down. Quit attacking one another. God, we have enough problems in the world for Christians fighting each other. The least they can do is get along and fight the devil and try to win people to Jesus Christ. So I hope this is a blessing to you, this chapter about charity. I kind of hope it's also a rebuke to you Christians who are just mean, hateful, horrible individuals that have none of the fruits of the Spirit, that you can learn what you're supposed to be in Christ. And I hope it also that it has been a, a great uh, tool of, of teaching. I hope you learned something that of all things in the Bible, that both Paul and Peter said were above all things the most important thing ever, they said it was charity.
that ought to show us how important it is. So thank you for watching. We'll see you next time at thecloudchurch.org. And we will begin in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, a chapter that talks about tongues. And basically it's the rules of speaking in tongues. So we'll see you next time. God bless.